Have you ever wanted to see the show? Now you can. All right, check it. Follow us on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Craig Hoffman. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. And typically in this time on Mondays, we give you a little bit of Take Command, the podcast I do with Logan Paulson. But as we recorded that podcast yesterday, we did not realize at the time, we couldn't have known uh, because of when we recorded it, that the Commander season would be over. Now, we knew it was a possibility, uh, which is not a pot shot at Ron Rivera. That just was kind of a fact of the time. Uh, but since things have changed a little bit since we recorded, I thought we'd have Logan on the show live. So, ladies and gentlemen, Logan Paulson. Hey! hey. Thanks for having me on, Craig. Appreciate it, buddy. Uh, you got it. Of course, I appreciate you uh, spending a little bit of extra time because we definitely don't talk to each other enough uh, <laughs> about football in microphones during a week. Um how do you feel today compared to the very raw emotion of when we recorded yesterday, which was just sheer frustration for the both of us? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you look at the defensive side of the ball, I think there were some positive elements to glean from that, but we kind of felt that way yesterday. I think Chase, uh, Duran played really well, Montez, F.A. Obata, Casey Tuhill, that group played really well. Jamin, I mean, he just every week seems to be getting better and more decisive and more confident. Um, you know, uh, Johnson had an excellent day playing corner against our Mar- uh, up against Cooper, who's one of the best receivers, not one of the best, but probably top 18 receiver in the NFL. So good for him on that. And so I think there was a lot of things. And when you really boil down the defense, it's like five plays, right? Five plays that tip the game one way or another for them. And so I think that's a little bit frustrating, but that's also the nature of defense. I think the side of the football that is is more frustrating and perhaps a little bit more compelling for the listener is is the offensive side of the ball. I think when you look at what <clears throat> Scott did, I think a lot of the things that I find very frustrating, and again, I have to kind of preface this by saying it comes through my lens, my lens of this West Coast Kyle Shanahan offense. So out of 12 and 13 personnel, which are you know two tight ends and three tight end sets, mm-hmm. they ran the ball 85% of the time. Oh. And to me, that is that is like the underlying crux of the issue. It tells me you're in a certain formation, certain personnel to run the football, and you're a certain formation, certain personnel to pass the ball. And then if you even distill it down even more, in the 11 personnel, which is the three wide receiver stuff. Right, which there is the is, basis of their offense, considering the three wide receivers that they have. Right. They have kind of run-centric formations there, too. And so to me, take advantage of the equity you've built in those formations. And what I mean by that is like when you watch them in 13 personnel, the defense is absolutely flying to the football. Like they're they're, before the ball is even handed off, they're triggering on the run. That is awesome. That's good. You want that reaction. It makes it hard to run the football, but you know what it makes it easier to do pass to open windows. Right. And so I think the fact that, you know, this offensive staff didn't capitalize on that, didn't capitalize on the equity you used, didn't use any of those excellent play action pass shots that you've cultivated and developed over the last four weeks, you know, like off the duo action, off the counter action, I think was just a little bit frustrating for me. And I think it it, it, it took it took Carson Wentz and made things harder for him than I think they needed to be, you know, and it's not like Scott didn't design good plays and good opportunities because I think there were some, but they just were higher leverage and a little bit more challenging for Carson. And I think that is the, that's the crux. That's that, that it makes it really challenging. I think for the quarterback to be successful. And um, that's my kind of one, if I was going to pinpoint one thing uh, that kind of encapsulates my frustration, it's definitely that. Um, I hear you on that and the play calling and the play design and the use of personnel and, uh, formations and all of these things are like incredibly important and really make or break a lot of games. But it also doesn't matter if your quarterback's sailing the ball or throwing it in the dirt. True. And and the accuracy and decision making of Carson yesterday was really poor. And I, I guess it like it's obviously easy now to look back and be like, "Yep, wrong decision." Feel like pretty confident that Taylor could play better than that. Um, but I, I'm not even asking. Like this is a hard question to ask because both of us were like, "Yeah." Based off how Taylor is playing, we think well, Carson can do better, right? But in hindsight, knowing what we know now, like, was that not, not just based off the results, right? Like, based off the process, was that actually the right decision? Or as we're reminded of what Carson was the first six weeks, should they have just stuck with Taylor, realizing that what happened was too high of a possibility? Is that a fair way to ask it? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I think... 
I, I think there is a little bit of like optimism bias, like because you say, oh, you know, the offense is executing this way, this kind of simpler, uh, more nuanced, um, lower variance offense is executing this way with Taylor. What if Scott were to take this same principle and just insert uh, Carson Wentz? These throws, the, the decisions are easier. The throws are relatively easier. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you open up um, an opportunity to push the ball down the field a little bit more, which, again, speaks to kind of the skill position players you have on offense. And I think that was the underlying assumption that we both made when Carson was going to be inserted back to the lineup. But one of the things I just pointed out is that that was not, that did not carry, right? There was no play action pass. There was no boot. There was no kind of finding these easier throws for the quarterback. So you bring Carson Wentz back, you essentially are running, you know, I don't want to say new offense because it's the offense they've been running, but a new version of the offense, the offense that more resembles what it was earlier in the year. You get really good production out of the offensive line and you get kind of a lackluster performance from Carson Wentz. And I think that's one of the things When you don't have elite quarterback play, you are always needing to manage the non-elite quarterback piece, right? Like, look at what the Giants are doing with Daniel Jones. Look at what the 49ers are doing with Brock Purdy. Look around the league, like how, you know, Miami with Tua Tungavailoa. Like, that offense manages average quarterback play, and I just felt like there was no managing. I felt like it was like Carson go and win and you're right Carson did miss some throws he did miss some bubbles like there was a bubble screen to Williams early there was a uh, a bubble screen to Williams at the start of the second quarter when they're backed up he misses that that's probably going for yards and does that change the complexion of the following play calls 1000 percent. so that also needs to be acknowledged but the idea that you miss that one throw and then your your third down call especially after the second Williams miss is basically to run vertical run three verticals with chippers, which I don't hate the chip concept, but you are limiting the amount of eligibles you have in the route concept. Three verticals directly into cover two. This is a cover three team. This is a cover two team. There are not a lot of answers versus three verticals into the defense versus those coverages. And so I look at like the plan there and I say, yeah, Carson throws an interception to Curtis Samuel. And I don't hate the throw. I don't hate the play design, but I just think there are opportunities to make that a little bit easier for Carson as opposed to stressing him with this vertical stuff now you say Scott might say to me hey Logan I told him to check it down there's that's entirely viable I get that but I also think that you could get there easier too right you can find ways where the check down is in the line of vision all those different things so um, those are the types of things that I think misinform that decision we made an assumption in good faith that the offense would resemble what it did with Taylor Heineke Yesterday, it did not. It was a different offense. So, my Logan Paulson, of course, uh, with us here on the Team 980s, the Hoffman Show. Uh, Logan, of course, my co-host on Take Command. You can also catch him on Command Center and his Instagram, Logan underscore Paulson82, has a bunch of great video content that I'm sure you'll be cranking out this week. Um, But the other thing that I would say is we also had wishful thinking that Carson would suddenly become someone that he's not. And, like, Carson the last three years more closely resembles the guy that we saw yesterday than the guy that we were hoping to see, which is not someone who's been completely missing. Like, second half against Detroit, first half against Jacksonville. We've seen flashes this year, but that's all we've seen is flashes. And and, in the most important game of the season, when you need him to put together a game and he's thrown no passes in the last two and a half months, I I think it probably was, in hindsight— way overly optimistic for him to not be a poor NFL quarterback. And like, I know that's super harsh to like phrase it that way, but that's kind of, that's what he was yesterday. Um, and that's kind of who he's been for not only this year, but even last year. And, you know, to, to even go beyond that, Logan, like one of the, the things that blows my mind about the coaching staff side of it for this year is, you know, how he was good in Indy last year was when they decided in the middle of the season they were going to stop putting so much on his plate and give the ball to Jonathan Taylor 35 times a game. And somehow Washington looked at that tape last year and was like, we know what we should do. We should put a lot on Carson's plate. And so it's it's some of what I'm saying with like Carson not being up to the task, but also like you're saying the task is far too difficult for this quarterback if you want to win football games in the NFL. You know, I was about to say, you you put it really nicely, and I think you just kind of – you you – you said that same thing on the pregame show yesterday. You set it up now. Like, he seems to do well in a run-first system. Like, he seemed, that seems to be where he's very comfortable. Like, North Dakota is a run-first system in large part. So why not lean into that? 
And I, that, I think that's the thing that is was shocking to both of us yesterday is that they didn't lean into that. It was in some ways like they leaned away from it. And obviously there was a lot of two-minute situations which affect the game flow, all those types of things, 1,000%. But I, I just feel like one of the assumptions we both made was that they were going to insulate him. They were going to take some stuff off his plate and make it so that he could do what he does well in clean pockets, and that just wasn't the case yesterday. And I think that's what's frustrating. And I think Miles Garrett said something in the media yesterday that I thought was right on the nose. When you're in third down and they have these longer developing concepts, yeah. it's easier to get pressure. And that's what Scott does on in, in his drop back stuff on third and long distances. He's going to run a deeper concept. That's Everyone knows what, what this offense is. That's what Norv did, all that kind of stuff. But I think it's also important to understand that that puts the quarterback and the offensive line in a very high leverage situation. And with Taylor, he's been a little bit better about not doing that. So um, that because because he can't do it with Taylor because Taylor can't push the fo- football down the field. So I look at that and I say that was the assumption we both made, and it was not met in good faith. They didn't do that, and so yes, Carson didn't play well, but also was he helped by the staff? No. And did those things compound on each other? Yes. And so still, I think the process of saying we could get him in there in the context of this conservative offense is sound. It's the next steps that were taken that make it fall on its face. Yeah. Um, it's also just wild looking at the, some of the stats from yesterday. I mean, they, they ran the ball 37 times and Wentz throws it 28. So, uh, you know, if Scott Turner's listening, uh, which sometimes it feels like he does, uh, but if Scott Turner's listening, he's probably like, what are you talking about? Like we ran the ball way more yesterday, but you know, so much of that game and the, the final statistics are skewed by that 21 play drive, which anytime you have 21 plays, like, that's the that's the one drive in twenty where you didn't have a big play and you score because it's yeah. impossible to have a big play and unless you have a bunch of penalties that sit you back and then you overcome them and you wind up like doing a zigzag across the field um, but like by nature you didn't get very far you just did it successfully enough to to go down but outside of that there's just not I mean they didn't score on any other drive in the game outside of the one field goal they lose twenty four ten so no other touchdown drive in the game and they were certainly run heavy on that drive and that that kind of tends to skew everything um but also you look at the distribution yesterday and one of the things that you know i was saying for a long time is the reason i would have stuck with heineke um up until this past weekend is they were so much better getting the ball to terry mclaren yesterday he only has two catches on five targets logan thomas has seven Jahan dotson has seven um but also curtis samuel has two targets yesterday and in a day when antonio gibson doesn't play he has zero carries and, and I think that's another frustrating thing about this, Logan, is, is we flip this kind of more fully towards the staff, and, and obviously all of this conversation affects the quarterback. You got to get the ball to your good dudes. And, and you yeah. have to, and like also when things work, keep doing them. Find, find new ways to get to them. And some of the jet sweep stuff, some of the, the Samuel out of the backfield stuff, it worked for them early in the season. They hit a little bit of a rut with it, and then they completely abandoned it. And on a day where you're struggling to generate offense, it's like, why Why do you not go back to those things? You have such dynamic players. How do you not find ways to get them the ball? And it just seems like that was part of the issue yesterday was, you know, they they just didn't do that. I mean, even the first series of the game, I know, I know um, Brian Robinson's banged up, but, like, why is Jonathan Williams getting the first series of the game? It's the yeah. first series of the game. You're trying to establish something. And, and, and it's decisions like that that just – Seemed pretty mystifying uh, across all four quarters, and especially yesterday. But things that have really, over this last month of the season, been problems. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that's a good point about the the Jonathan Williams thing, because that was something that kind of stuck out to me, too. Like, oh, wow, he's getting the start. That's interesting. And we all knew B-Rob was banged up, and so maybe that played a bigger role than um, than, than, than the staff let on. He still had 24 on. carries yesterday when it was all said and done. I know, which is a lot of work uh, for a guy, you know, who was supposed to be pretty hurt, and he didn't look pretty hurt to me. It looked like he had a really nice performance and ran hard and did everything you want him to do. So so good for him and kudos to him. Um, and with regards to the offense and the play calling and all that kind of stuff and getting your playmakers involved, I just look back to what San Fran did last week and how they were just so masterful at kind of saying, here's this formation, here's an easy throw for Brock, here's an easy touch here, here's a pitch here, here's a whatever. And they just... You can tell everything is very thoughtful. Everything's very deliberate. And everything is schemed to kind of stress the defense. And that is not what 
that this offense yesterday felt like. It didn't feel like that. It didn't feel like it was putting you in conflict. It didn't feel like it was stressing you out. And um, it didn't feel like it was finding ways to get easy touches and easy decisions for the quarterback. It was like, it felt very much like we're just going to call the offense. And I, that's, that's been a, a point of criticism I've had, again, for the staff for a while. You know, it was like, how much are you pushing to elevate the playmakers? And, um, and I, I think that's, that, that bears itself out with regards to the limited touches for Curtis, the limited touches for Terry. And, um, and I think Scott would probably look at us and say, hey, you know, we try to get him a target on the second, the second throw of the game on the corner. But again, you know, obviously that's an interception there. And right. the matchup with Ward on Terry wasn't as favorable as they would have liked. But I think that's really interesting. And um, again, one of the things I'd like to see Scott and the staff push more is, can you find easy throws, easy decisions, easy plays, as opposed to making everything feel like it's challenging? Right. Um, you know, I mentioned a couple of times on the show, uh, both shows, the radio show and the podcast, like I've been watching hard knocks in season and not that Cliff Kingsbury is some NFL genius by off or, or offensive genius by NFL standards. They've obviously had a really rough year in Arizona, but it's been interesting multiple games this year where they can get him on the headset and he's like, we got to get hop a touch. And I just, yeah. I don't know how often those conversations happen. We got to get Curtis a touch. We got to get Jihad a touch. We got to get Terry a touch. Um, it feels like occasionally they do. Um, they get the reverse to Terry yesterday, but like, he gets 12 yards. Run it again. Like, mm. it's there's something, and that, that's something that I want to do a podcast on in the offseason, by the way, is like, why doesn't, why don't they do this in the NFL? And sure, there's good reasons on, on a lot of yeah. them, um, but that's that's an offseason project. Uh, we'll do it then. Uh, Logan Paulson, co host of Take Man, uh, of course, with me, Craig Hoffman, here on the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. All right, Logan, last thing before we wrap up. Uh, Ron Rivera says they're going to play to win the game, Herm Edwards style. Uh, coming up this weekend he will not name a starting quarterback a lot of us then go well that probably means Sam Howell isn't playing does that make a whole lot of sense to you yeah I mean he's a fifth round draft pick and I look look around the league look at people that were taken ahead of him Ritter Pickett Malik Willis Um, this was not a very strong quarterback class for a reason those guys were taken ahead of him I had them all ahead of him in my quarterback evaluations this last season and I just think you're going to be putting him into the fire against a very good Dallas defense, and that doesn't seem like a fair opportunity for someone that you have a lot of confidence in. And, you know, we've talked about this on on the podcast quite a bit there. You don't practice a lot as the third guy, as the third string quarterback on an NFL team. Like, you don't practice at all, hardly. Like, it's on you to kind of cultivate your own development. And I just think that would be unreasonable a little bit, you know, if, if, um, like what is his mastery of the offense? Like what is his mastery of the, the techniques, the footworks, the things that he was struggling with earlier, the timings, like, you know, Carson's getting reps in this offense, Taylor's getting reps in this offense and they still struggle with it. So is it fair to put him in on a week when you have guys like Terry and Jahan and, um, you know, Leno's going to play in this game. Is that fair to them to say that we're not going to try and win? We're going to put the young guy in and see what he's got. I don't know. I don't know if that is fair to them. And so I would say that Taylor probably gets a start. That's not to say that, that, that they don't that's, that Sam doesn't start. They might change their mind. They might say Sam gives us the best shot to win. Um, although I, I would hypothesize that that's not the case. I would, I would think that they would go with Heineke. Yeah. Uh, and if they go back to Wentz, um, yeah. like what's going to come out of that? Uh, I tend to think you're probably right that Taylor, and, and on some level, like I hear you, but like also – that's why I hate the answer, honestly. Like, of course, once the whistle blows and kickoff happens, you play to win the game. Always, 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 always. But you can make decisions as an organization to say, you know what? Winning doesn't really do anything for us. Like, congrats. We feel good about ourselves. Pat on the back. But, I mean, if you want to go like the draft argument, sure. What's the difference between the 16th and the 19th pick or the 16th and the 13th pick? Some years it's huge. Some years it's not. Um, that That's a little bit more ambiguous. But, like, the development and the reps and Sam going into the off season, knowing what it's like to play at an NFL speed, be like, Hey man, this is the standard. This is what it's like when Micah Parsons is after you. And I understand you don't want to get him hurt. You don't want to kill him. You don't want to do whatever, but like how, if he goes through the entire season, not experiencing an NFL football game when you could easily put him out there. And he is someone who's going to factor in on some level to either being in your starting quarterback mix, depending on how you attack it, or your backup mix even next year, because he's the only guy under contract. Wentz, right. is, Wentz is probably getting cut, uh, and Heineke's a free agent. To me, that's just a silly, like, 
principled for the sake of being principled uh, when you actually have the wrong principled approach that doesn't actually hold up when it's like, Hey man, let's, let's go out there and yeah, you're going to have Terry and you're going to have Jahan and like go ball out and show us that you belong in the mix for starting quarterback next year. Yeah. I mean, I, my answer to that would be, he's a fifth round quarterback. How many fifth sure. round quarterbacks play at all in their rookie year? I, I can't, I'm Not many, but you're many. also like, what are you playing for at this point? Right. And so what I would say is you're playing, I think for optics a little bit here, like, They've been seven wins since Ron's come into the coaching position, right? I think they've had uh, seven wins last year, seven wins the year before. I think getting to eight wins does something for this narrative that the team and the roster is improving. So I think that it, there is something there from that standpoint. We all know that it's more optics than anything, but I would argue that there is there's value to winning this game just from like saying, "Hey, we're eight, eight and one," as opposed to seven, nine and one, or whatever the heck it is. So that's something I would I would kind of call attention to and. And I don't, and again, I don't, from what I've seen and what I've heard, Sam is not ready. And I can't think of a situation. And that's, that's, w- that's an important data point. Yeah. Like, and from what I've seen and what I've, and from in my career, when people aren't ready, it's, it's not even fun to watch them play. Like I've seen that happen with O-linemen, seen that happen with receivers, seen that happen on special teams and guys just get straight dogged and all of this stuff this this narrative this upside this potential is just shattered their confidence is broken they got to wait another whatever so if he's not ready and everything i've heard from the staff and from what i saw in preseason says he's not ready don't put him in unless you feel confident he can do something like look at sam ellinger like that guy he's been in the nfl for a year he was a sixth round pick he's been around he got his start and dude struggled mightily right so I look at that same thing with, with Sam. Like he might come out, they might put in some some gadgety stuff. I don't think they will. I think it'll be like run the offense. I don't think that bodes well for his success. And I think ultimately you want him to have a good a relatively successful first outing. And if he doesn't, I don't think that that's good for him or the organization. Yeah. I could also see a situation where like he gets the second half or something like that. Something, yeah. Like um, that would be more yeah, reasonable. Little, they're probably gonna rest their starters, right? Dal- well, Dallas Dallas is playing for the division. And, oh my god! And the, the bye week, so uh, it, they I mean, we don't know yet um, when that game is going to be. Um, but them and Philly will play at the same time, whether it's one or four. Um, they'll yeah. play at the same time, and like they won't know until you know. I mean, look, if Philly's up by thirty at halftime, then they they might be like, all right, well, we tried, um, but who knows? It's just less pressure um, than, yeah. than starting and whatever. Um, I don't know, man. It's. It's frustrating when you're in a meaningless week and you're just playing for jobs and playing for whatever. I, I don't know. I tend to think that it's also a good week to like bring up some practice squad guys and get them a regular yeah. game check. And there's a lot of kind of back end stuff that happens. Like uh, someone right. like it's like I know we got a cut, but like yeah. someone I'd like to see is like Chris Paul. Yeah, like, no, 100%. everyone's talking. Every, everyone's talking about how he's much, how much he's developed. Right. This would be the week, you know, like see what he looks like. Yeah. The one thing I would say is this: um, I don't agree with you on the optics thing. I don't think eight, eight, and one is any better. Do, don't think it matters. One. No, I think that they are what they are. They had the Giants game where that was like as hyped of a game as we've had since at least twenty twenty, if not twenty fifteen, around around Washington football. And as some people were saying back to twenty twelve, um, and yeah. you bombed. And then season on the line at home against the Browns team that's worse than you. Record wise, um, although ascending and really look, they're a team that's in your neighborhood because now you have pretty much the same record and you bombed. Yeah. And so winning a meaningless game against Dallas with no pressure doesn't do anything for me. And I don't think it does a lot for a lot of people, but um, in, inside the NFL, maybe it does. Maybe it does. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. We will, uh, of course, be coming right back with Michael Phillips here on the Hoffman Show as four o'clock is approaching. And Logan and I will have a fresh edition of Take Command. On YouTube, uh, probably Tuesday afternoon, uh, and it'll be in your podcast feeds Wednesday morning. Make sure you're subscribed uh, on your favorite audio podcast platform or YouTube.com slash at 1067thefan for the full episodes. I also post clips at Craig Hoffman. Logan, appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Want more from Craig and Logan? Subscribe now on the free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. More Hoffman Show next on the Team 980 and the free Odyssey app.